Harry Fox from Mount Sinai here. So she is going to discuss about autopsy pathology. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Sure. My pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me come over. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about the death certificate, uh, autopsies in the current realm of advanced medical technology, medical malpractice and the utility of autopsies, autopsy requests, review of cases and uh, correct death certificate um, uh, completions or you know the part that the clinician is supposed to fill in correctly but typically doesn't and then uh, just briefly on autopsy techniques and what we expect from you so um, hospital autopsies versus forensic autops autopsies hospital autopsies are restricted to hundred percent natural death anything other than hundred percent natural death is supposed to go to the medical examiners now there is a slight um, caveat to the uh, um, the medical examiner no longer does autopsies on therapeutic complications. They used to, but now they really don't. Um, they've decided not to. Um, and so we are much better at doing uh, natural deaths and complicated medical autopsies than the medical examiner. The medical examiner is used to gunshot wounds, um, stab wounds, jumpers, you know, people that commit suicide. Uh, people that get hit by the subway, people that overdose and die, uh, they're used to those autopsies. They're usually pretty straightforward, they're quick, they're easy, and they're signed out immediately. Um, our complicated medical uh, autopsies with pacemakers and um, intraventricular pacing, uh, you know, or, or assist devices, or um, anastomoses in the GI tract, or um, uh, coronary artery bypasses with adhesions everywhere. They don't like them. They're not as good at doing those as we are because we have more experience doing them. So we do the natural deaths. They do the, the uh, trauma cases. Um, the therapeutic complications, usually what happens is we do the autopsy and then we send them the PAD once the PAD is completed so that they can then sign the death certificate. On therapeutic complications, we still cannot sign, the clinicians in the hospital cannot sign those death certificates. They still need to be signed by the medical examiners. We do the autopsy, we send them the PAD and based on the PAD, they sign the death certificate then the funeral home can pick up the death certificate from the ME's office. They bring it to the hospital to pick up the body. Okay, so that's how that works. Other than the therapeutic complications, any other, other, any other case besides a therapeutic complication that in, involves anything other than natural is going to be done by the ME. So any criminal, violent, or uh, cases of neglect where they die, those are medical examiner cases. All accidents, motor vehicles, falls, industrial accidents. If it's an accident, if there's a death because of some kind of trauma, it's an ME case. All suicides, all deaths relating to a potential drug overdose or poisoning is going to be an ME. Sudden death of someone who appears to be in good health. So somebody that's in their 30s or in their 40s that has no medical history that you're aware of suddenly dies. Um, that's a medical examiner case. They will take those cases. Uh, deaths unattended by a physician. So if you die at home and there's, um, you don't have any medical uh, history uh, uh, of any kind of diseases, say you're in your 50s and you've never been to the doctor and then you happen to die at home, uh, that's an unattended. It's unattended by a physician. They're not in the hospital. They're not expected to end up having any medical disease that would have killed them, and they're too young to be expected to have died suddenly. So those are medical examiner cases too. Any person that dies in the court system or in the legal system, whether it's police officers or prisoners or, or anyone being held by uh, correction uh, facilities are all automatically medical examiner cases. Um, that's due to complications of uh, diagnoses or therapeutic complications. As I said, those are medical examiner cases. It, they have to be called into the ME. They will assign an ME number, but typically now the therapeutic complications will be done by us, but they still have to be signed out by the medical examiner. 
the death certificate does. Uh, that's related to employment. If something happens that causes a person to die because of some event at work, that's an ME case. And fetuses, if, it, if the fetus dies because of maternal trauma, maternal drug abuse, uh, or the death is unattended by a physician, say the fetus is brought in dead and they say that it was um, born dead. Um, well, we don't know if they really were born dead. You have to investigate it. Were they really born dead or were they suffocated? And you can, you can figure that out usually. Uh, did the baby take a breath? If they said they were born dead um, and never breathed, even if they took one breath, we investigate that as a medical examiner, you would investigate it. So any death that occurs in an unusual or suspicious manner also must be reported and they can make a determination as to whether or not they're going to do the case. There's no 24 hour rule in some case, in some institutions or some states uh, or some cities, there's a 24 hour rule. If you die within 24 hours, so if you, if you, if you, have a medical procedure and you die within 24 hours of that medical procedure, it's automatically a medical examiner case. That's not true here. Um, if you have a medical procedure and you die within 24 hours of that medical procedure, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be an ME case. Uh, it may be ruled a therapeutic complication, it may not be. Uh, it depends. They'll make that judgment. The clinicians should be calling. Um, so all of these that are listed here must be reported regardless of the interval of onset of disease and the death. So um, even if it's been, um, say there was an accident and they lived for two weeks uh, or three weeks and then died, that's an ME case. Uh, that's, there, it doesn't matter how long it's been. If the proximate cause of the reason why they died was because of the motor vehicle accident. Say they had a motor vehicle accident and they had uh, fractures and then they developed sepsis and pneumonia and they died. Well, the motor vehicle accident, if it hadn't been for the motor vehicle accident, none of those complications would have developed. So it doesn't matter how long they lived after the trauma. If the death is directly related to the trauma, it's an ME case, irrespective of amount of time. Okay, definitions on the death certificate. Cause of death. So the cause of death is the disease or combination of diseases that's responsible for the fatality. Uh, the, the most important thing that you have to look at or the clinicians are supposed to look at is the underlying or proximate cause of death. So the underlying or proximate cause of death is spelled out right here. Uh, is that which in a natural and continuous sequence, unbroken by any other event, uh, inter, uh, effective intervening cause produces the end result and without which the end result would not have occurred. The underlying cause of death should be an etiologically specific disease or injury. So I'll go into that a little bit further. We'll, we'll, we'll delve into that. So immediate cause of death, that's what the clinicians will put first as a top line on the, on the death certificate. Immediate cause of death is sepsis um, due to what? And so sepsis is not etiologically specific. So uh, you could say sepsis due to uh, sepsis caused by pneumonia or you could just say pneumonia uh, with sepsis. Uh, and then why? But why? Because pneumonia, again, is not etiologically specific. So immediate cause of death is what killed them immediately. So um, there may be one or more immediate causes. Uh, they may occur over a brief or prolonged interval, but none absolves the underlying cause of its ultimate responsibility. Immediate causes usually are not etiologically specific. So pneumonia is not etiologically specific, but you can put that as an immediate cause. Sepsis can be put as an immediate cause. Uh, it's not the underlying cause, it's not the proximate cause. You need to know why they got the sepsis, why they got the pneumonia. Um, but those are the immediate causes why they died at the time that they did die. Mechanisms of death are alterations of the physiologic and biological um, uh, functions whereby the causes exert their lethal effect. 
So mechanisms are never etiologically specific. So DCIS is a mechanism of, of death. Sepsis is a mechanism of death. Uh, cardiac arrhythmia is a mechanism. Congestive heart failure is a mechanism. Exsanguination is a mechanism. Exsanguination doesn't tell you how they exsanguinated. Uh, so a hemopericardium with cardiac tamponade, that's a mechanism. So the heart fills up with blood, the heart can't beat. That's a mechanism as to how they died. Due to a ruptured infarct of myocardium of the myocardium. So that's the immediate cause. So there's a ruptured, there's pericardial tamponade due, uh, um, uh, due to a ruptured uh, myocardial infarct. That could be a top line. That's the immediate cause. Due to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heart disease. So the rupture of the myocardium is not etiologically specific. It could be because of stab wound. It could be because of um, a trauma. It could be because of a ruptured myocardial infarct a week pre previously. So you need to know what the um, proximate cause, the underlying cause is, and the underlying cause is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in this scenario, okay? Manner of death. So how did the cause arise? Was it natural or was it violent? So anything other than natural is considered to be violent. There's some kind of trauma of some type. Um, so again, natural deaths are by definition 100% natural and the hospital physicians only do natural deaths and can only sign the death certificates on that natural, 100% natural deaths. Um, if an injury either physical or chemical contributes to the death, no matter how minor the contribution, the fatality is not considered to be natural. Violent deaths are subclassified into accidents, homicides, or suicides. Um, and in this state, therapeutic complication is, is used as a, um, manner, but um, the term is considered to be non-judgmental and non-accusatory. It doesn't mean that the clinicians made a mistake. Uh, not, a, a, not synonymous with, with malpractice. In fact, most of the time it's in no way uh, associated with the possibility of a malpractice suit, uh, and I'll show you why a little bit later. Um, some jurisdictions use medical misadventure or therapeutic misadventure rather than therapeutic complication, but it, it does, and some states don't use the term therapeutic complication at all. Um, so for proximate cause, the most important thing is to keep on asking why until you get to the, um, the underlying etiology, the, the specific cause for the sequence of events. So if a patient dies of sepsis, why did they die of sepsis? If they had pneumonia or decubitus ulcers, right? So why did they have pneumonia and decubitus ulcers? Because they were bed bound. Well, why were they bed bound? Uh, because they had paraplegia. Well, why did they have paraplegia? Well, they had paraplegia because they had a spinal cord injury. Well, why did they have a spinal cord injury? Did they have a motor vehicle accident? Were they, uh, did they have spina bifida? Um, and, or spinal cord deformity at birth? Did they have a birth trauma? Um, if it was because of gunshot wound that caused uh, severing of the spinal cord, then a gunshot wound is the cause, even if it was 30 years ago. And if it's the reason why they died from sepsis, because they were bed bound and got pneumonia and sepsis, then the manner of death is a homicide. Okay, because the if you go all the way back to why they got that sequence of events, the gunshot wound made them paraplegic, which made them bed bound, which made them get pneumonia and decubitus ulcers, which made them get sepsis and die. Gunshot wound is the um, proximate cause, uh, and it's a homicide. Now, if they have someone incarcerated for having shot the person, that person will then be charged with homicide, with murder. Uh, or involuntary, you know, whatever it is, they'll be charged. Um, if they don't have anyone incarcerated and they don't have a clue, then they're not going to do anything because they, they can't. But if you always need to make, make that appropriate determination on the death certificate, have the ME make that determination, and then the police will get 
notified and an appropriate follow-up will be done depending on what the situation is. Okay, so here's an, ex an example of a death certificate. Um, that happened with Brady, didn't it? The, hmm? With Brady, the guy who they made the Brady bill for, uh, the shop. Uh, uh, well, he would he would he would have been a, a I mean he, that was also thirty years before yeah, the pneumonia and the yeah, toxicology yeah, said was the yeah, sure. It would still be a homicide. And and then it's it's changed I mean most of the time they're incarcerated. if they if they caught the guy, they're incarcerated. But while they're incarcerated, that charge will be upgraded to a, an actual homicide, even though it's thirty years later, if they're still incarcerated. It was also like a modification of the laws. You know, like, like there, no. Four years ago, they used to have what's called the year to day rule, where the proximate cause was severed if there was a 366 day lapse. I've never heard of that. And I wor I've worked at the medical examiner's office since the uh, 80s. So um, I've never heard of that. So, and every state is different. And so it's jurisdictions, different state jurisdictions handle things differently. Um, and some jurisdictions actually still have um, coroners if they don't have a physician. Some coroners are physicians, some coroners are not in any way medically trained. Most places in the U.S. now have a medical examiner system, not a coroner system. That's a good question. Yeah. So if you have a patient in the hospital who dies of pneumonia, going back to your example, they were shot 30 years ago, and it's considered a homicide, then we shouldn't be doing the autopsy on that patient, right? Because that's not a Correct. cause of death. Yep. So you contact so the Emmys and they'll, they'll take that back. case. They'll take that case. Okay. I'll show you an example. Well, I can tell you about an example. We had a case. I, I talk about it later. but. Um, we had a case where the patient had been shot 30 years previously. They had uh, their uh, paraplegic. They got um, an abscess around the spinal cord. Um, they didn't want to be treated anymore. Um, they ultimately ended up getting sepsis with an abscess along the spinal canal um, and spinal cord. Um, the clinician actually signed that case out, the death certificate, as sepsis and natural. And fortunately, they asked the family if the family wanted an autopsy. We reviewed the case in Epic and realized this guy's paraplegic because he was shot 30 years ago. It's not natural. The clinician cannot sign the death certificate. The death certificate was null and void. We contacted the medical examiner's office and they picked up the body. They did the autopsy, not us. That's that a lot of things, like if a guy falls off the building 30 years oh, yeah. ago, that's, a, that's an occupation. And the, clini the clinicians miss it all the time. So, you know, part of our job as pathologists is to educate the clinicians about what they're doing wrong. And they do a lot of things relating to death wrong. And that's part of the reason why I'm giving this lecture to you guys. So that when you get to be attendings, you can try and educate your colleagues because they really are are have a lot of misconceptions about death uh, and the need for an autopsy. They really do. Um, okay, so on the death certificate, there's the immediate cause. So that can be sepsis due to pneumonia, uh, due to our consequence. So immediate cause sepsis is not is a mechanism, so you don't really want to put that. So immediate cause could be pneumonia due to um, being bed bound uh, due to or as a consequence of old age, um, you know, if they're really, if they've got or osteoporotic uh, advanced age or whatever it might be. Um, and then you can put other significant findings as well. So if they have a history of hypertension uh, or they have a history of diabetes, you could put that below as well. Anything, you know, anything that's major that you can also put as uh, part two. But that's the part that we put in. Um, and so due to or as a consequence, the last one is the is should be the proximate etiologically specific cause that you finally come to a why and you can't go any further.
Okay, so cause of death is your opinion based on all the information that is available to you at the time. That means the clinicians too. It's their best when they call up and they say, oh, I don't know what to put. <laughs> and you say, well, based on the clinical findings, what did you think was going on? What, you know, what was your best uh, assessment of the etiology based on all the evidence that was available? based on the laboratory values, based on the hematocrit, the chemistry. Um, ask yourself why the patient had the condition uh, you are writing down. It's unacceptable to put as standalone diagnoses bronchopneumonia, pulmonary embolus, acute myocardial infarct, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, cardiac arrhythmia, congestive heart failures. Those are not etiologically specific. Bronchopneumonia, why? Pulmonary embolus, why? Did they have hypercoagulability? Um, did they have a, um, uh, an evidence of a DVT previously or not? And sometimes you can say hypercoagulability uh, due to unknown etiology if you don't know. If they have a pulmonary embolus um, and you don't know why, a lot of the times it's because they have a hypercoagulability state, but it might also be because they've got cancer. It might be because they were bed bound. Um, so you try and, you know, try and work it out as best you can. Um, manner of death, again, there's six categories. Natural is the only one that clinicians in the hospital can sign out, but then there's homicide, suicide, accident. Undetermined is used at the medical examiner's office. If they put undetermined, it keeps the case open indefinitely. So that if, a, if it turns out to potentially be a homicide, um, they can follow up on the homicide. There's no um, time restraint on, on the interval of uh, being able to charge someone if they suddenly determine that it's a homicide. Therapeutic complication we already talked about. So in 2016, there was a, a publication of the Autopsy Pathology uh, Manual on Atlas produced by the CAP. Um, and in there, it lists that autopsies are the gold standard for evaluating the accuracy and diagnosis and um, the outcome of therapy. Um, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability, which was stated by um, uh, Sir William Osler in the 1800s. Uh, and that's true today. It's, it's, medicine is an, an exact, inexact science. Um, and so because of that, it's important to check on why things are happening um, so that we can advance science further. We haven't reached the threshold of knowing everything in medicine, not by a long shot. And because of that, doing autopsies help us advance science and advance medicine. Okay, so this is the changes in autopsy rates that have been determined over time. So we have had, if you do, 5% autopsy rate versus 37% versus 100%. Your major error rate decreases the more autopsies you do. In 1960s, the error rate doing only 5% autopsies was almost 50%. If you do 100% autopsies, your error rate drops down to maybe 20%. Our error rates have dropped slowly uh, to the current time. However, if you look at 5% autopsy rate, we're still at around 27% major error rate. So a lot of room for improvement and the clinicians don't realize this. So what does a major error mean? Uh, and I'll go into that. First, why, why, so there's, Okay, hold on. Let me see. Did I, I want to jump to this. Okay. So classification of diagnostic errors. So a major error is a class one or class two error. Class one is a, um, if you knew uh, before the death uh, what the major diagnosis was, it would lead to different management and could have prolonged survival or cured the patient. That's pretty major. <laughs> and class two is, a ma class two major discrepancy is knowledge before death would not have led to longer survival even with correct treatment, but you treated it completely wrong. 
So examples for class one would be a pulmonary embolus treated as a pneumonia or tuberculosis uh, um, treated as a malignancy. And we've seen that. Um, class two is osteomyelitis is a source of uh, system, systemic sepsis in a patient dying from multi-organ failure. Um, so class major discrepancies are are truly major. Um, so why do we do these uh, pre-mortem and post-mortem diagnoses at autopsy? This was a 10-year study. The reasons for conducting an, an autopsy evaluate the accuracy of the clinical diagnosis. Clinicians think they got it right because they do radiology. They think they got it right because they have lab values. They think they got it right because they have all of the technology available that we have. Well, despite technology, our autopsy error rate has not dropped much. And with all these advanced technologies, we still get it wrong at least 25% of the time. Major wrong at least 25% of the time. So we're not good at it, and they don't know that. Uh, investigation and discovery of unsuspected diseases. Sometimes there's a multitude of different things. And you want to under, understand the natural course of the disease, the natural progression. I had a case where there was a AAA bypass or AAA uh, repair that graft got infected. It caused sepsis that tracked along the um, uh, at, along to the colon or uh, went along the ascending colon to under the liver and there was a great big abscess collection under the liver. The clinicians thought that there was some liver type problem going on. They didn't know what was going on. This, this, what happened was that they got aspergillus that tracked all the way under the liver and caused the patient to die from sepsis, but it was because of the repair. Uh, without doing an autopsy, wouldn't know that. Um, assessing the validity of new diagnosis and therapeutic module, uh, modalities. So when they do new modalities, it's even more important to do autopsies. Uh, evaluation of quality of medical care and education of the medical professionals. Uh, and it clarifies medical legal issues surrounding the death. If there's a question of a medical legal situation in a patient that dies in the hospital, encourage the clinicians to get an autopsy. It will help them rather than hurt them. It will never hurt them, and it might help them, and I'll show why. Um, okay, so this is again, um, so our autopsy rate is now, we've, it was less than 10%. We've got it back up to about 14% with education, but we also track all deaths through the hospital, and we force the clinicians to ask about an autopsy on every death. Um, and so now they're starting to get a little bit more comfortable with asking for an autopsy. If you ask for an autopsy correctly, you will get an autopsy. If you, if you say, you don't really want an autopsy, do you? Oh, we already know the cause of death. You know, you don't really need to get an autopsy. Sometimes they tell the family that they, you know, no, you don't really need an autopsy. If the family will is, is requesting it, they can. They sometimes will say, well, we know why they died. Well, no, they don't. Um, and even if they are pretty good and pretty sure about why they died, um, you can uncover a lot of other findings. And it can give closure to the family. It can help the family. So clinicians are more uncomfortable with autopsies than the families are asking about autopsies. At, clinicians are more uncomfortable with death. We're not, but they are, because their whole goal is to keep the patient alive. So when the patient dies, it makes them feel like they've done something wrong. And that's not true. And they need to realize that they can learn from these experiences, and it may help them in future cases. Okay. Um, so autopsy rates have been steadily declining across all institutions. Um, and it's our goal to try to change that trend. I already showed this. The minor discrepancies, you know, they're not so minor. Uh, carcinoma of the lung and a patient dying from a ruptured aneurysm. You know, okay, yes, they're probably going to die from their cancer, but dying from a ruptured aneurysm is not ideal either, and it's, it's an incorrect diagnosis, and if the family has Marfans, knowing that they've got Marfans and had a ruptured aneurysm might be a good thing. Um, pancreatic ulcer in a patient dying from pulmonary embolus. Uh, well, 
peptic ulcer disease is potentially treatable if you've got H. pylori. So, you know, these are not all that minor. So um, I'm going to skip this one. Let's go to this one. This is, this is where the clinicians, um, their diagnosis uh, as the cause of death versus the actual cause of death. So true positives are in black. Uh, white is false positives. So they thought that it was an electrolyte imbalance when it wasn't. Um, and a false negative um, is in tan, this, this blue. So they get it wrong the vast majority of times when it comes to a multitude of different things. Cardiac shock, um, they're a little bit better at that. They probably have an EKG on. Septic shock, they usually have a wet, high white count, so they're usually okay at that. But look at how much they're wrong. Um, hypovolemic shock, let's go back, oops, oh, sorry. In, in this one, they're pretty good at doing, making a diagnosis of neoplasm, but they can be wrong, it can be a false positive and a false negative, they can think it's a tumor and it's really not, or they can, uh, false negative, so sometimes they think that it's a tumor and it's not. Sometimes they think it's pneumonia and it's actually tumor. Um, pneumonia or uh, neoplasms are usually pretty good at, but not always. And respiratory system abnormalities, they're the worst at. Okay. Uh, diagnostic errors. Again, discrepancies in major errors. This was in 2006, seen in 39% of cases. Discrepancies in minor errors seen in 50%, and a third of those cases had clinically relevant diseases. If you have uh, radiology that is unclear as to what's going on, or if the clinician is unclear about what's going on, the discrepancy rate skyrockets. In cases where there's transplants, the discrepancy rate, major discrepancy rate, is can be up to 68%. You need, they need to get evaluation of the cases. 39% um, of major diagnostic errors, about half of the class one errors, uh, as I, uh, uh, about half of the major di diagnostic errors were class one category. So half of that 39% were discrepancies where if they knew the diagnosis beforehand, the patient could have had prolonged survival or been cured of their disease. That's, that's pretty major. Um, and major diagnoses are both overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed. So it, you can be wrong in either way, um, either um, calling it cancer when it's not, or um, not calling it cancer when it really is. Um, and ongoing importance of autopsy is providing feedback to the clinicians uh, and therapeutic process. Um, hello? Hello? Oh, sorry, you got the wrong number. Okay, um, value of autopsy in the area of, era of high-tech uh, medicine. Discrepancy rates, you know, we've already kind of gone into this. So they looked at autopsies from 2007 and compared them to the more current autopsies, and they still found that there were major uh, discrepancies. There was a slight drop of 4% and dropped down to about 16%. But minor discrepancy rates increased by 12%. And microscopic examination of the autopsy tissues uh, contributed to the establishing the cause of death in 20% of cases. Autopsies, uh, the most common discrepancies are myocardial infarct, pulmonary embolus, and pneumonia. And improper imaging was uh, significantly associated with a higher percentage of major discrepancies. Again, if the radiology is unclear, you're going to find more, more discrepancies from what the clinician thought there was versus what there really was. 
Um, so even in the event of uh, high technology, uh, autopsies are still the gold standard. We just did an autopsy yesterday on a case where they thought there was uh, um, bleeding uh, in the uh, in the uh, pleural space of a patient that was in um, hospice. She was very sick, but the bleeding was actually not in the pleural space. The bleeding was actually in the retroperitoneal space that was collecting uh, under the diaphragm and extended from the diaphragm to the pelvis, likely from uh, a vascular intervention through the femoral vessels, which is not the first, second, or even third time I've seen that happen. Um, so those are cases that the clinicians need to be aware of. Um, they forget that doing a femoral line procedure can cause a slow bleed. No amount of platelets that you give or, or um, uh, FFP is going to end up stopping a hole that is bleeding that needs surgical intervention that's too big to be plugged by normal um, uh, platelets. Those small leaks will continue to bleed and the patient can compensate, 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 crash and die. And you see it all the time. So see it, we see it too much. So, and they need to be aware of that. So as when they're, if you're doing CP and they're asking for platelets, find out why are they requesting platelets. You know, if they've got a retroperitoneal bleed, you might want to remind them that patients can die if the hole needs to be fixed surgically. Okay. Uh, one reason cited for drop and autopsy is the fear of uh, malpractice. So uh, the medical malpractice literature uh, looked at this, and uh, in uh, 30 of 49 cases uh, where the physician defendants, the physician defendants were acquitted in 30 of 49 cases. So 61% were acquitted. Uh, when the autopsy findings were either slightly or strongly in favor of the person bringing the lawsuit. So the autopsy findings supported the plaintiff, but 61% of the time the clinician was acquitted. So the autopsy didn't hurt them, right? In 14 cases, the autopsy did not clearly favor either the plaintiff or the defendant. And in 79% of those cases, the physician was acquitted. So if it's equivocal, most of the time the physician is acquitted. In 19 cases, the autopsy slightly or strongly favored the defendant, the physician. In all 19 cases, there was 100% acquittal. If you have findings that help you, you're acquitted. If you have findings that are equivocal, you're usually acquitted. If you have findings that are against you, you're still usually acquitted. So why do they get successful lawsuits? It's not because of the management of the medical care of the patient that died. It's because they did something that was um, not the standard practice of care. So if you have an anesthesiologist that's supposed to monitor temperature during surgery and they don't place a temperature monitor on the patient because they think the procedure is going to be short and the patient dies because of malignant hyperthermia because the case went longer and you gave anesthesia that triggers malignant hyperthermia, that's going against the standard of practice for anesthesia and you're going to get successfully sued irrespective of what the autopsy findings show. So if you do something that's against the standard of care for your profession and something happens that's detrimental, you're going to be sued because you've done something that's opposite from the standard of care. But that's the reason why physicians get sued, not because of disasters that happen in medical care. Most of the time when you do an autopsy, you will uncover a complex set of disease entities 
that make it so that any jury looking at the case would say, geez, look at all the things that were going wrong. No wonder they had a difficult time managing that patient. It's not surprising they died. So most of the time, autopsies help. Okay. Um, when should we request an autopsy uh, and when do we need consent? Um, permission to perform an autopsy must be requested from the next of kin of all patients who expire at Mount Sinai. The clinicians are supposed to ask for an autopsy on every single solitary case of a person dying in the hospital. They're now at Sinai, at the main hospital, they have to. Do they? Uh, I'm not sure that they really do. Um, and they're supposed to exhaust all reasonable efforts to obtain post-mortem permission. Uh, I don't think that happens. Um, for cases where the medical examiner ass assumes jurisdiction, the next of kin does not need to ask for permission for an autopsy. The medical examiner's office makes a determination whether an autopsy is going to be done if it's a medical examiner case. And it doesn't matter whether or not the family wants an autopsy or not. Even um, cases where it's like um, religious objection, they, they try to um, uh, be cognizant of the religious objection and not do an autopsy, but, they, but sometimes they still do. Like some of the rabbis, the conservative rabbis will come in, um, like the Hasidic rabbis, they'll come in and actually collect all the blood uh, from, from the autopsy itself and make sure everything that came from that body stays with the body. Um, so they do try to help with that, make sure that they're not causing any friction with the religious communities. Autopsies are free. The family's not charged. The hospital eats the cost because it is quality assurance for the hospital and we learn things and we provide tissues for research. Uh, if the autopsy is unrestricted, you have access to the tissues for a multitude of different research purposes. If the autopsy is within 24 hours, even better, you can do DNA, RNA, you know, protein analysis of all the different tissues and learn about metastasis, which we know very little about. We do resections of primary tumors and we treat metastasis with chemo and radiation therapy. We do not know much about cancer metastasis and why the metastasis and the heterogeneity about metastasis. So doing autopsies in the current environment is critical for advancing medicine. Um, unrestricted autopsies do not prevent an open casket at funeral, including removing the brain. The brain is removed in such a way that the funeral home can easily uh, have the body be open, uh, have an open casket, and looks beautiful. If you think about it, if a, if a person has died from a motor vehicle accident and the funeral home can make them look pretty enough so that they have an open casket, certainly doing a full autopsy, including removing the brain by opening the skin on the scalp posteriorly so that when they're lying in the pillow, nobody sees anything, okay? So it doesn't cause any problems with funerals even open casket funerals. So, you know, people are always freaking out about, you know, oh, I don't want the head touched. Well, we don't do anything to the face. We don't disfigure the cadaver, but we can remove everything without causing any problems. And they should be aware of that so that the most information is from a full autopsy. Inevitably, when they put a restriction on, the restricted area is where the, where the cause of death actually lies. Um, but they can have restrictions. They can have no eyes. They can have no brain. They can have organs have to be returned to the body for burial. Then you sample the tissues, take tissue in cassettes, and put all the tissues back into the body. Normally, we take the body tissue out and um, evaluate it, release the body without the organs, and we hold the organs and fix them and evaluate them and take as much time as we need. Um, that is in our autopsy consent now, so it's very clear that we're retaining the organs and um, that we'll dispose of the organs. Um, but some people want the organs put back in the body, that's fine. Uh, we have in the consent that there will be research, that it's open to doing research, but if they don't want research on tissues, they can restrict that as well. 
<laughs> Legal next to kin is the person responsible for getting approval for the autopsy. If it's the bereaved wife, uh, that is the legal next to kin, and the kids are saying they don't want an autopsy, the wife, despite the fact that she is bereaved, needs to be asked whether or not she wants an autopsy, because she may have a different opinion about an autopsy than the kids. Uh, and so the clinicians need to know that they're asking the right person, it's the legal next of kin that's making a determination of um, who, whether or not there's an autopsy or not. Uh, and uh, a um, healthcare proxy is not a legal next of kin. As soon as the person dies, healthcare proxy goes out the window, unless the healthcare proxy is actually um, uh, the person that is um, the executor of the will. Uh, then they, they would be the uh, legal next of kin. So this is all written out in the, in the current up-to-date um, autopsy consent. I actually have listed the order of the next of kin so that the clinicians hopefully ask the right person. <laughs> Call the medical examiners. I already went into that, and we had the gunshot wound discussion. So. Oh, and the medical examiner's office is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and are available for any questions. Um, but sometimes they're not too helpful, and if there's an issue, then you can always call them, uh, call our office or call me. Um, autopsy techniques, there's Verkow technique, is where you do it organ by organ, removing it from the body. The medical examiner's office does a Verkow uh, technique. They remove the organ one at a time. Uh, they remove the lungs one at a time, the heart. It's a little harder to end up getting a good correlation of the relationship between one organ and another. Um, and so the Verkow method is very quick, it's very easy, but um, it's, it's not quite as good at getting down to the nitty gritty of natural deaths. Um, and so it's not the technique that we use here. Uh, Rokotensky is a technique that most people think that we use in the hospital, uh, the unblock uh, autopsy. Rokotensky is not really the unblock or unmass technique that we use. It's, it's an in situ di dissection in part as an unblock removal. Um, but, it, but we do not do Rokotensky. We actually do unmass uh, technique where the entire mass of the internal organs are removed as an entire block, and then the, that entire block is slowly dissected out. There's also an unblock technique, which is similar to the en masse technique, where you remove like the thoracic organs, and then the abdominal organs, and then the pelvic organs. Um, sometimes we do a combination of en mass and en block, so um, a lot of the times, I'll end up having them remove the um, thoracic and abdominal cavities and then deal with the pelvic cavities as a separate block, and that's fine too. That, that's how we do it most of the time at Sinai, but it doesn't, a lot of the times, if you've ever worked with Calvin Keyes over, he's our morgue supervisor, he'll do the entire en masse, including the uh, pelvic organs, all as one great big block, and then you slowly dissect it out. As soon as that block is taken out, the funeral home can pick up the body. So you can, you can end up doing an autopsy and have it ready for the funeral home within an hour, including brain removal. So don't ever tell the funeral home, oh, it won't be ready if they want the funeral three hours from now or in the afternoon and it's the morning. Don't ever say, oh, no, we, we, we can't do it that quickly. That's not true. Uh, we had a funeral home that they wanted a, the funeral that day, and I said we can have it within the hour, and we had it within the hour. They picked it up two hours later, but they, we, did, we did have it ready. So it's not that hard, especially when it's in block or in mass. So what a preliminary autopsy diagnosis is provided within 48 working hours, um, and we list the, um, I always require a concise clinical history listed in bullets, uh, the proximate cause of death with all contributing causes of death as, as well as significant diseases, and then a review of systems uh, that lists organ weights and incidental findings. 
Um, this information helps the clinicians immediately know why the patient died and what the problems were. So it's the most helpful for them. Uh, organization of the final autopsy diagnosis, anatomic diagnosis, you don't need to do a repeat of the clinical, um, it's just the CPC and the clinical hit a, a short vignette of the clinical history. Um, but on the FAD, you don't need that uh, bullet point of clinical, you just need the final diagnoses, all of the pertinent final diagnoses, proximate cause being the first one at the top of the list, uh, and then um, you put them in the diagnoses in order of importance. Uh, CPC is um, you should avoid speculation in the CPC. Don't speculate as to why they do. Have it be based on scientific evidence and cite your references. Um, list autopsy restrictions, including start date and time, so that we know the elapsed time between the time of death until the autopsy. We can get the time of death from the epic, but we don't, we need to know the start time and date of the autopsy in the FAD so that we can calculate how much of an interval there was from the time of death to the time of the autopsy. That's critical for research purposes. Um, you can put that into the PAD as well. It's extremely helpful. Um, and then for the FAD, put the time and date uh, uh, the organs were reviewed with the attending. You can put that in the PAD too as well. Gross findings are going to be external and internal gross findings, summary of sections, uh, culture results if you take any, clinical history again, do not cut and paste from the chart, review the records, summarize the final sequence of events that led up to the proximate cause of death. It's got to be a story that's concise and that's you know, written in normal language. Don't, don't cut and paste with a whole bunch of abbrevi abbreviations. I hate abbreviations. The abbreviations, uh, depending on what subspecialty you're in, abbreviations may mean different things. So try not to abbreviate. Uh, and neuropathology and the PAD and the FAD always put in the general autopsy report the brain weight. You don't have to put anything else about the brain. You can say neuropathology report, uh, will be added as an addendum, but always put the brain weight. Sometimes what happens is the brain gets lost. And if the brain gets lost, but we know it was supposed to be normal, and we know the weight, even if we don't know it was normal, if we know the weight, we can have a pretty good estimate as to whether or not it was normal. Because if the weight is normal, it's not edematous. If it's normal weight, it's not atrophic from Alzheimer's disease. If it's normal weight, there wasn't a great big hemorrhage in the stroke that caused edema. So a normal weight in an autopsy report can help you write up a limited neuropathology report if you lose the brain. I didn't say we lose them, but it does happen. Okay. Um, Okay, autopsy, document the structural, uh, structurally demonstrable abnormalities that support the underlying immediate and contributory causes of death. Um, sudden death without gross findings requires histology. If you can't find anything wrong grossly, take a whole bunch of histology. It will help. You may find some abnormalities, some findings in the kidney that show that they're hypertensive, some findings in the heart that shows scarring, uh, take a bunch of sections in the lungs, maybe they've got pneumonia and you didn't, you know, the weight's not elevated, take sections. If there's autopsy restrictions, take more sections. Um, they can have all the organs be put back with the body if they want them, uh, the organs to be put back into the body for the funeral. Uh, then you have to sample the organs and take sections up front uh, and you're never going to be able to go back to that tissue to take more sections. So that if, in a situation like that, make sure you sample the lungs uh, extensively, make sure you sample the heart extensively. Don't just do your normal number of sections and if you see anything abnormal, section it a little bit more than you might ordinarily. Histology will kill you better. Here. Um, okay, and I don't think we've got time to go over the cause of death, um, the listings. Uh, on the death certificates, um, the most important thing is, is putting the immediate cause of death um, and the manner of death. Um, but, 
uh, just for as an example, this is a 42-year-old man with a history of chronic alcoholism, found dead at home. He had cirrhosis and he had a blood alcohol content of 0.35. So he was intoxicated um, with a high alcohol content. And um, so he had acute alcoholism and uh, he had cirrhosis due to alcohol, presumably. So it's acute and chronic alcoholism. But in this country, alcoholism is considered to be a natural. So even if you have acute intoxication, uh, if it's not an accidental overdose, it's considered to be a natural death. Acute and chronic alcoholism is natural. This one, 18-year-old who uh, drank too much at a party and got an alcohol content of 0.48, which is lethal, uh, that's a little different. That's acute ethanol intoxication as an accident. So you got to be a little careful with alcohol. Um, it, can, it can either be accident or it can be natural. Other drugs, if you find them in the system, it's an, ac it's an accidental overdose, um, if there's cocaine, or suicide. Um, I had a case where the family was Catholic and they didn't want it to be a suicide and uh, so I actually calculated the drug quantity in the brain because I had the brain weight, the liver, I had the, the liver weight and the blood, six liters and determined that there were, he had to have taken like 60 of one type of pill, at least 40 of another type of pill, and maybe 30 of a third type of pill that was in his system based on just those volumes. Uh, and I told the family, with this amount of drug ingestion, I can't imagine that it was an accidental. This sounds more like it was a suicide. And um, so it's marked as a suicide. And I told them, you know, if you in your own heart believe that it was not a suicide, then be assured that you can believe that and you can feel that way and that's fine. Um, you know, this is just for documenting for the state. Um, and if the Catholic Church has a problem with that, that's, that's between you and them. <laughs> so, but those are the things that, that you are dealing with when you're working at the medical examiner's office, okay? So that's about it. Uh, any questions? Okay. When, when you said we need to explain to the family about the autopsy, um, we, I think that we don't really explain to them because they might like uh, regret and reject the autopsy if they really know what how the procedure is. Um, well, I mean, the way that we describe it in court um, is that when we do an autopsy, we are doing surgical like incisions to open the body and we carefully remove the organs and surgically uh, inspect them for disease entities uh, to make sure that everything that could have been done was done uh, to provide education to make sure that the clinicians are aware of any problems um, to potentially help with future science with these disease entities um, and you can be assured of what the problems were and if there are diseases that are potentially treatable in the future knowing the diagnosis now may be beneficial for the family in the future. So if you have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease and you have a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in a patient in one of your family members that dies, um, down the road, if someone starts having cognitive impairment, then you can say, my family has a history of Alzheimer's disease and we need to end up having the treatment for Alzheimer's disease be treated early. Alternatively, if you don't know that it's Alzheimer's disease, it could be Alzheimer's, it could be Lewy body disease. Um, if there's a treatment for Lewy body disease, um, if there's, um, you know, so, so if you can hone in on what the, what the disease entities of the family are. We're now coming to tumors that have genetic abnormalities that are specifically treated with certain treatments. And knowing for sure what you're dealing with is helpful. 
Uh, we just had a case where the patient had a, a, a um, culture TB positive by culture from cytology. Um, I think a, a needle aspirate or something, maybe from the lung, I'm not sure. Um, but they had TB culture positive um, a patient who was treated for TB, then developed lesions in his brain stem in the base of the brain. Well, tuberculomas, TB in the brain presents as a mass at the base of the brain. So they thought this patient had TB that was recurring in the brain and treated him again for TB. He died. The disease that he had at the base of the brain was poorly differentiated carcinoma, not TB. So knowing the, the tumor, knowing the type of tumor, if you know the genetics of that tumor, you may be able to look at the family risk for developing certain tumor types. So uh, like Lynch syndrome, where you are susceptible to a multitude of different kinds of tumors, gastric tumors, um, the tumors in other places. So knowing the genetic makeup uh, of the different tumors, if there are tumors present, first it's important to know, are there tumors? Is it sepsis? Did the clinicians handle it properly, handle the care properly? Um, did they do everything they could? If they did, that's reassuring to the family. Um, if they didn't, but they still uncover diseases that are diseases that may be important for the family to know about, so that they can be careful themselves. Do they have Marfan's? Are they at risk for a triple A for, for an aneurysm and for rupture of an aneurysm? And no one knew that up until now. Um, did the patient have malignant hyperthermia and the family has, has a genetic predisposition for malignant hyperthermia? Knowing that's critical, you don't want to end up having anesthesia ever. Um, you know, the first time may kill you. So the autopsy, even in the situation where the family is a little bit reluctant to do an autopsy, if you approach this, the autopsy request in a very compassionate, caring way, most of the time they'll want an autopsy. If they don't, that's fine. You know, it's, it's entirely individual as to whether or not the person responsible for the autopsy, uh, the, the immediate next of kin, wants one or not. But if it helps, sometimes it helps them have closure, sometimes it helps the family to know what happened. Um, if it was a motor vehicle accident, sometimes it's it's good to know, well, exactly what killed them. If they'd gotten to the hospital sooner, if, if they'd gotten treatment sooner, would it have mattered? Um, you know, when you see somebody like Princess Diana, have a, an autopsy to, you know, those are going to be medical examiner cases they are going to do an autopsy. But, I mean, I think that the family probably wanted to know, you know, why did she die? Um, and the hospital, the clinicians probably learned something from that case. So, any other questions? Yeah, okay, related to this question. Mm -hmm. So, the, the situation is most of the time that we face, and as he was trying to ask, so is it in the Department of Pathology when we already have the consent in front of us? Right. So as residents, uh -huh. so would you suggest that it's our responsibility to at least talk to the no. family no. and discuss or no? No, no. If that was your question, then no. I mean, pathologists... Okay, right. I mean, so, so I'm all for communicating with patients and communicating with families. I mean, I did a fellowship at the ME's office, and I, I'll tell you that um, probably three quarters of the work at the medical examiner's office is talking to families. So I'm comfortable with it, and I like to do that. Um, it, it's up to the individual pathologist as to how much they want to communicate with family members. As a resident, it's not your responsibility to talk to family members. Um, if you communicate with your attending and your attending and you say that you want to talk to the family and, and could they be present while you do talk to them, you know, then it can be a learning experience and, and it might be fine. Our fellow has actually talked to some of our patients. Um, I get calls all the time from family members asking about autopsies. 
technician that say, look, sometimes they ask us. I mean, it, it's so, right. I mean, it, it, if you're comfortable doing that, that's fine. Um, I don't have any problems with doing it. Um, I actually like to do it, but not every pathologist likes to do it. Um, there are a lot of clinicians, a lot of general uh, clinicians out there that are not very good at communicating with families as far as what an autopsy, autopsy, autopsy findings are. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes we're better at doing it. So, I mean, I, I, you, I gotta leave that up to you guys as to determine whether or not you feel comfortable and feel like you can do a good job at doing it. But if you're good at doing it, you can help the family. Like before doing the autopsy, I mean, suppose it, it happens sometimes here mm -hmm. also that at Long's and I was, or even in our system at least, that probably the clinicians have not explained the next of kin about the autopsy, right. what is an autopsy, and many a times that uh, the next of kin already is not in a good state of mind by losing somebody close, right. and they were just told that we want to do an autopsy and without explaining what is it. And right. many a time it has happened that they just thought that, oh, the pathologists are just going to take a needle biopsy or something. Oh, you know, okay. And then like, so when they found out that, oh, this is what you guys are going to do. And it happened, I, okay. that, that they don't even know what is an autopsy. Okay. So, 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 so we, then, so then, we, so then, I mean, if, if that's the situation, you can either, if you don't feel comfortable talking to the family, you can bump it back to the clinicians and call them and say, you need to explain to the family what this consent means. That we're going to do, a com I've had cases where the, the clinician, we had one case where the clinician got an autopsy consent for brain only because of a, um, an inherited disorder that affects the spinal cord, not the brain. And so I called the clinician and I said, you need to talk to the family and explain to them that a brain only will not give a definitive diagnosis for this disease entity. And that if they want a diagnosis for this disease entity, we need to be able to do the spinal cord. We can do the spinal cord from a posterior procedure, not disrupting any of the rest of the body. Um, so we got a consent for the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so pathologists typically, what in a situation that you guys are dealing with, I would bump it back to the clinician and say, the family is upset and they did not understand what this autopsy entailed. Could you explain it to them? Or if your attending wants, you can explain to them what I just told you, that you know an autopsy is a surgical incision and we you know carefully examine the organs. Um, and if you know whatever restrictions you want, the body is, is um, treated very um, respectfully. Uh, the organs are treated very respectfully, um, but, you know, it's whatever you want. Um, if you want just one organ examined, if you wanted organ, the organs examined without actually being removed from the body, you can do that too. I would make sure that they're also aware that if they want some real answers, the best autopsy is an unrestricted autopsy. But we treat the organs and we treat the body with a great deal of respect. Um, and, but again, it's up to the family as to, you know, it's their loved one. So, you know, they're the ultimately. Is that we're having another specialty consenting I know. patient. I know. For a procedure that we're doing. I mean, conversely, we don't consent patients for a cardiac catheterization. Right. I mean, and, you know, that makes right. sense. Right. So, and I, I agree. I, think that I, be I, I do. I, I agree because I think. You know, I tried to get, um, right now we have a, a decedent affairs, but the decedent affairs is staffed by people that are like secretaries, that, that don't have any experience with actually asking for an autopsy. Um, Denver, their autopsy rate is 25%. And the reason why it's 25% is because they have a dedicated decedent affairs that is responsible 
for asking for autopsies. It's not left up to the clinicians who do a shitty job. Um, it's left up to a select group of people who have been trained in how to do it properly. So, you know, we're getting there. I think educating the clinicians, your job is to help educate the clinicians. Half of them won't ask the family, half of them don't know that an autopsy is free and that the family won't get charged. They have no clue. They think that the family's gonna get, so when the family says they're gonna get charged, they'll say yes, that's not true. You know, so you need, it's, a, it's an educational thing. I've been trying to give uh, educational lectures to the clinical staff in the hospital, um, I've given at least three or four different lectures to the clinical staff at Sinai. Um, you know, it's just over time trying to get the correct information out there. So we, we don't have enough information. I had one one case that there was no chart that the chart was very minimal. Yeah, and the patient was there. Yeah, we, we do get that all the time. In a situation like that, you, you do the best you can. Uh, we, you know, my then you're looking for gross findings. My attending asked me to call the panel number just to know what happened in the last hour. And, uh, I, uh, we try not to do that. Um, if they died at home and were brought in, then you could. Um, you know, it, it again, it depends on your comfort level. I know Calvin Keyes, our morgue supervisor, is not uncommon that he will call family members um, under certain circumstances. In a situation like that, it, you know, if you, if you go in and you do the autopsy, you don't have to have the clinical information. You could, you could do the autopsy. The problem is if you go in and you don't find anything, then then it's a situation where I would call up the family members to try and get a little bit more information. Problem is if, well, I mean, so if it's an, if it's an en masse autopsy, if you still have all the organs available to evaluate, you do the autopsy and find nothing, you still have all those organs to evaluate. Then you can pick up the phone and say, you know, we're not finding an awful lot you know, we'd like to, to get a little bit more clinical information. I think then it's relevant. I don't, I don't encourage people calling before an autopsy when there's a request for an autopsy. Um, I, I prefer not to contact the family members. They're already dealing with a lot. You know, I, I don't like disrupting their emotional well-being with, with another intrusion. Um, but if you do the autopsy and don't find something that's significant, that, then I think you're almost um, you're justified in, in getting a little bit more information um, and and giving it a day, you know, is you know might help as well. So yeah, but normally I would not do that. Most of the time when we have cases like that where they come in, there's a lot of pathology. You know, they're demented, and so the brain shows marked atrophy. And I mean, you can talk to the neural people if the if look at the brain weight, if the brain weight's completely off, if the brain weight's um, a lot less than what should be for that age, um, you know, they've, they've probably got some dementing disorder, and, and you've got to cause a death, uh, probably. Um, if, you, if you see something that's clearly cause of death, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but it's as long as you have the organs available, then it doesn't matter that you contact them later. The only problem is if it if you have to return all the organs to the body for the funeral, for, because the, then it's going to go within um, when you finish taking your samples, all that tissue goes with the body. Then it's a little bit more problematic because you don't know where to look, um, and having information from the family might be helpful, but. I still am reluctant to do it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So, do you still have my memory stick here? Oops. Oh, you're good.